Pull for right now, if you have a Bible, um, go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Uh, 1 Samuel 25. So we have been walking through on Wednesday nights, we've been walking through these different character studies. Um, and when we first started this, I had, I think, 27 or 28 character studies that we were going to do and then we we're going to move on. And we've, we've, we've blown past those 27, 28 quite a while ago. And in fact, I have started um, putting the kind of the outline that I um, put together, I put it on the back of that prayer request list. So if you have a prayer request list and you want a, maybe a cheat sheet, you can look on the back of that. Um, there's nothing proprietary. It's just what this is exactly the thing that I use um, as I'm just walking through looking at these different characters. So we've been looking at these different characters, men, women, couples. Um, we even looked at here a while back, both a person and a place of Shechem. But we've been looking at these people, both good and bad, both famous and infamous, talking about who they were, why were they in Scripture, why do we know them, and, and really just asking these three questions of, of walking through here. So every, uh, what we've been trying to do is just highlight these people from Scripture. So... There's people that we haven't talked about that you say, well, I would like to spend some time together on a Sunday night talking about them. You just got to let me know. So we have probably for the last 20 have been um, customer request. You know, listener request is what, is what we've been doing. So tonight we are on the person of Abigail. I put there the wife of Nabal. If you are looking at those notes in the back of that prayer request, let's put the wife of Nabal because there is another Abigail mentioned in some of the chronological accounts or the genealogical accounts, there's another Abigail mentioned that sometimes you can get confused. So you have an Abigail that's in the line, the son of, or the um, daughter of Jesse, I think is how it's used. But you, so if you do like a, a word search for Abigail, you'll come up with two different Abigails. So I want to differentiate, make her the wife of Nabal. So when we come to this, 1 Samuel 25 is kind of the main, 99% um, of what we know about Abigail comes from 1 Samuel 25. That's why I asked you to turn there with me. So when we come to her, we're going to ask the same three questions. Who was she? Why do we know her? And what lessons does she teach us? So thinking about this um, biographically, factually, just data, what do we know about Abigail? Or maybe put it this way, who was she? And I put it out there this afternoon, so a bunch of you already knew what we were going to be talking about, so you had an opportunity to study up. And nobody did it, did it? A beautiful woman? How do we know that, Mr. Ron? Because it said so, okay. So, so you're probably looking down there in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25 and verse 3. Is that right, young man? So it says here in my translation, the woman was discerning and beautiful. All right, so was a beautiful woman. Okay, what else do we know about her? She was Nabal's wife. Now, some people may say Nabal. Um, and you, you can pronounce it however you want to. He, he, doesn't, he can't come and correct you. So uh, Nabal, Nabal, whatever you, however you want to say it. So we know that he, she was the wife of Nabal. All right, what do we know about him? He was rich, he was harsh, he was mean. All right, how do we know all this? Because it says there, it says right there pretty much in verse 3, doesn't it? Verse 2 and verse 3, okay? So it says in verse 2, the man was very rich, 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats. Um, then it says down there in verse 3, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. Mine says evil in his doings. Evil in constuing? Evil in his doing. Okay, I'm telling you, Levita, my ear—it just got me all, got me all discombobulated. Okay, so I was like, I don't know, I don't know the words constuing, but I'm gonna roll with it. I just got, we were just gonna move on. <laughs> so, all right, so evil in his doing. House of Caleb. So, what does that tell us? What do we, what do we remember about Caleb? Okay, so that probably takes us back to, what is that, Numbers 12, Numbers 13, Numbers 14, somewhere in there, where Joshua comes to the promised land and he sends the 12 spies in, Caleb being one of the 12, um, sends the 12 spies into the promised land. Two out of the 10 come back and say, let's go, rah, rah, rah. 10 out of the 12 come back and say, oh no, we're not going. And God gets upset and mad at him. 
And that's when they wander around, wander around the wilderness for 40 years. And 10 out of the 12 and the rest of that generation um, all died out in the wilderness. And out of the 12, there were only um, two that were able to go into the promised land. And that was Joshua and Caleb. Uh, Moses didn't even get to come to the promised land, not because he didn't believe, but because he had a, another infraction on striking a rock earlier on that disqualified him. Well, I don't understand it either. I don't understand. It just seems so unfair. He should have got to go to the promised land. All that he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, like, and there's another one. You can write it down. Numbers 15. It says in Numbers 15, I can't remember the exact verse, but that they found a young man who was picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And that was a no-no to be picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And they took him before the Lord. And then God said, stone him. And so it says that this young man died because he was picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And I think, well, that doesn't quite seem fair, except for God had said, don't do it, and they were willfully disobeying God. So um, some things I, I agree with you, Miss Levita, they don't, quite, they don't quite seem fair, but then again, the fair is in September. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you've got Nabal. He was a, tell me again, he was an evil man in all his doings. That's what your Bible says. All right. And we know that uh, he was a Calebite. So going back to uh, numbers. So Caleb and Joshua, they are faithful. So then they come into the promised land. And in Joshua 14, you see where that allotment is given out. And the allotment is given out for all the tribes. And one of the places, I, and I even put it there, Joshua 14 and verse 13 through 15, Caleb says, hey, I want this property. I want this ground. And then that was the ground that Joshua said, fine, you can have it. And he goes down and conquers it. Anybody remember where that ground was at that Caleb said he wanted? So it was the, the place of Moan. All right, so if you're there in 1 Samuel chapter 25, it says in verse 2, there was a man in Maon, Moan, Maon, I don't know. May, I'm going to go Maon. So there's a land of Maon. Well, that is the same property that was the inheritance of Caleb. So he says the Calebite just kind of gives us this idea that this guy named, named Nabal, he was a descendant of Caleb. Okay, but he is still living there in the same land handed down from generations to generation. So when you see down there, um, it says a man in Maon whose business was in um, Carmel, you will see um, on the west side of the Dead Sea. Some of you ha may have a map that uh, shows you a map of the Dead Sea. If you do, um, when you look at the map of the Dead Sea, for me, I see, a, I see a face of a bunny. You go about halfway down the Dead Sea and you look down. If you're looking at a map, it's going to be on your right-hand side of the map. There's a little bit of an outcrop of the, of the ground there in the Dead Sea. And when I look at it, it looks like the head of a bunny. And so if you go across the Dead Sea and a little bit up is what they call the wilderness or the plains of Maon. And right there you will find not only Hebron, which was big for David when he assumed the throne, but you'll also find the town of Maon as well as the town of Carmel, 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 however you want to pronounce it. So all of that stuff is right there in that same region. So you've got Nabal, who's living there. He's living there on family property that he inherited from generations before him, from um, coming down from the line of K Caleb. It's on the west side of the Dead Sea, about halfway between the north and the south boundary. He was a very rich man, but he was harsh, badly behaved. Um, she was pretty. What else do we know about her? She was discerning. She was discerning. So what does that mean? Sure. Okay. So she wasn't discerning on her wedding day. She was discerning after. Okay. Maybe that's right. Maybe she didn't have a choice. It also said she was a woman of good understandings. Okay. Good understandings. Yeah. All right. Do we know anything else about her? Kids? What? She married David. She did? We'll get to that when we get down to the second portion, but she did. She's the one that went and gave him all, met him, the people that was coming in, and gave him all kinds of cakes and different things because Nabal was... 
Sure. Ridiculous. And we'll, we're going to get to that in the second section. So I'm not skipping past you. She's a servant's trusted her. She what? Her servants trusted her. Okay. What about like factual? Like, do we know her brother's name, sister's name? Do we know her daddy's name, her mama's name? High school GPA? <laughs> Did she let her in school, varsity? Did she get a varsity letter? Did she have a hobby? Okay, so I, I couldn't find anything else. I mean, I know that later on it talks about her having a kid through David, and so we know that information. We do know that, and that's, we're going to get to that part of the story about how she married David. But as far as at the onset, during her life with Nabal, um, really nothing is given. We know more about him than we know about her. And the only thing that we really know about her is she is married to him, and the Bible describes her as being a beautiful and discerning, or a woman of understanding, a beautiful and discerning uh, and intelligent woman. Um, that's all that we're really given about her. We really don't know where she came from. We really don't know as far as did she have kids with Nabal. We don't know about what her family situation looked like on her dad's side or her mama's side. All, and we don't even know how long they've been married. We don't even know how, long, how old she is here in 1 Samuel 25. Only thing we know about her is that she was a beautiful woman and that she was a woman of understanding and discernment. All right? So that's all I could find as far as who she was. So now we're going to ask the question about why do we know her? And to kind of build that story up about why do we know her, we need to turn back a couple of pages to 1 Samuel chapter 23. So in 1 Samuel chapter 23... You're coming into the middle of the story of David. Now, David, by this time that you're coming in, he's already been anointed as the next king of the nation of Israel. Samuel has already anointed him. Saul knows that Samuel has anointed him. Jonathan knows that Samuel has anointed him, and he is really good friends with David. Saul has already disobeyed God, and God has already told Saul, you're out, David's in. So David knows that he's the next guy, Saul knows he's the next guy, Samuel knows he's the next guy, Jonathan, Saul's son, knows that he's the next guy, and they're all just kind of wondering, well, when is God's timing going to come about that all of this is going to come out? All of this is going to shake out. Well, in the meantime, if you remember your Bible story, um, David is serving in the court of Saul. He's playing a harp. He's doing some bodyguard stuff, but he's serving there. Well, harmful spirits start coming upon Saul. Saul starts getting jealous because of who David is and what David is doing. And so Saul says, you know what? I don't think that I'm quite done being the guy. I think that I'll just kill David, and then that way I'll continue to be the guy. So he tries to kill David. He's unsuccessful. He tries to kill David. He's unsuccessful. David figures out this guy is going to keep trying to kill me. So David says, see ya. And he takes off. And so he's on the run. And as he's on the run, here comes Saul. Saul's chasing him down, has some, has some trumped up charges to try to accuse him of. And so we have this story unfolding that we come into the middle of in 1 Samuel chapter 23 of David's on the run from Saul. Saul has his army. David has his band of misfits. And they are running from Saul. And as they get ahead of Saul, I mean, there's just this cat and mouse game that's being played. So it says there in 1 Samuel chapter 23. And uh, let's look down there at verse 24, I think is what I wrote down. Yeah. So as Saul is chasing David, it says they arose, talking about David, and they went down to Ziph. Ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. So what is, why do I bring that up? Because part of what is going to happen with Nabal has to do with the fact that David and Saul are running around this area. So Saul is down here in this area and he is running from, or David is down this area running from Saul. And so later on in the story, that is why David has um, awareness, he has knowledge of the um, shepherds of Nabal is because they're spending time down there in the same countryside. They're spending time down there on the same street corner, if you will. So Saul is chasing David and then it says that uh, they as Saul is chasing him, it says in verse 27, a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul left his pursuit of David and went to take care of the Philistines. Well, in the meantime, it says in verse 29, David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Now, if you have your map in the back of your Bible, you will see that En Gedi is to the east. 
If you think about Maon, um, it's more in the wilderness side. You have the Dead Sea, and then there's a wilderness area that goes up there into a mountain range. And uh, so there, En Gedi is right on the shore of the Dead Sea. So David goes, he's hanging out there. Saul gets done with the Philistines. This is chapter 24. Saul says, I think I'm going to go back and I'm going to pick back up the pursuit of David. And it's in chapter 24 where David is in the cave. And remember, Saul comes into the cave and he's going to take a bathroom break. And as he's taking his bathroom break, David sneaks up and cuts the corner of the robe of Saul. And Saul gets done taking his bathroom break and walks out. It's like, all right, let's keep going. And David walks out after him and holds up the corner and said, hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't. So, you know what? Why, are you, why do you have beef with me? If I'm really your enemy, then why are you still alive? And I hold the, quarter, the corner of your garment. And so Saul said, you're right, David. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going back home. So that's where chapter 24 ends. So then you pick it up in chapter 25 and you get down there to verse 6. Uh, no, no, let's say verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing at all, nothing, all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give, give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. So when he comes to make this request, this is not just a random person that shows up. David and his men had spent some time, as they're on the run from Saul, they're coming in interaction with Nabal, Nabal's servants and Nabal's shepherds. And so there's been some backstory, if you will, that is there. Now it's a feast day, and you can just imagine, David is probably sitting there going, finally, Saul is not chasing me. Finally, I've got a little break. I think that we're going to have a celebration. We're just going to take a little bit of R&R. &R. We're just going to take a little minute for ourselves. So we've been taking care of the shepherds and making sure they're all good. We've been taking care of these people. I know they belong to Nabal. I know when he's shearing his sheep, that's usually towards the end of the year. So I know that uh, we have an opportunity to maybe have some kindness repaid. So David makes his request. But now comes the evil and... I can't remember, Miss Levita, what you said. Uh, evil, evil in all of his doings. Right? So here you come with the evil in all of his doing in verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servant, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all of this. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking, so the men from David went to the men of Nabal and said, hey, can we have some food? And Nabal said, no. Okay, so he said no. I read this in, in, in the way of our Western mindset. He made a request. The guy said no. It would be like the same thing that you come to our house tonight and that sweet little Micah comes up to me and says, Daddy, may I have a cookie? And I say no. Next. Move on. They did it then. They always brought people. If there was someone traveling through, they always brought him in. They fed him. They let him stay there overnight. Fed their uh, Yes. But in our mindset, we just see it as he said no. So like I read it, I just say he said no. But apparently, like you said, Miss Levita, um, not only was that not done in the culture, but there is a whole lot more that is being communicated in just what we read in our English translation. There's a whole lot more there than what we often read just on a simple reading through it. Because, verse 13, And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. So what David is saying in a sense is, Saddle up. We're going to go and rock them sock them time. I mean, we're going to go. We're going to knock some heads together. We're going to go down there and we're going to take it by force. Now, I would think, okay, so obviously there was a lot more communication that took place than just, may I have, may I have a happy meal? No. And we go on. I mean, there was a lot more that was taking place. But 
what, we, what, we're, what we're reading in the story is Nabal's response, and we see David's response. David, uh, David tells his men, um, I'm going to take 400 men. That's what it says in verse 13. And uh, 200 are going to remain with the baggage. So he's got 400 men all strapped up with swords going down there to do some battle. And this is then when Abigail steps into the picture. So all this is going on. Abigail says in verse 14, the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet her master, and he railed at them. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I look at that and I'm like, well, he didn't rail at him, he just said no. But that's where sometimes reading it black and white English, sometimes we can skip past the emphasis and we can skip past the meaning and we can sometimes skip past everything that is implied. Um, the way that I think about it is, According to Jaylene, I have about 50 different uses for the word okay. Mm, at, least. At, least, at least 50 different ways. There's at least 50 different definitions for my word okay. And so there will be times we'll be having a conversation and I will say okay and well, I meant this. And then I'll say okay, I meant that. I said okay and I meant something else. And so it's one of those things that sometimes if all you're reading is, well, Spence said this to Jaylene, he said, okay, you might go, well, I don't know what the big deal is. It could be the way I said it, I've been told. It could be my facial expression when I said it, I've been told. It could be the, the way my voice, okay. I mean, it could be how I said it. There could be a lot of things that could be impregnated into this idea of how I say the word okay. So when we read, David said, please do this. Nabal said, no way, Jose. We just read it and go, who cares? And then it says, no, there was more to it than that because Nabal railed at them. So what does Abigail do? She takes all those goodies. That's right. So it says down there in verse 18, is that what you're talking about, Miss Levita? So it says in verse 18, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five shears of parched grain and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on a donkey. So she hears about this and instead of going to Nabal, she says, nope, gather all this food. I'll take him a picnic lunch and maybe satisfy him. So that's what she does. She gathers all this stuff up. She uh, takes off and verse 19 tells her young man, go on before me. I will come after you. Didn't tell her husband Nabal. Verse 20, she rode on the donkey, came down to where David was at or came to, towards David. He came towards her. She met him. That's in verse 20. And then in verse 21, he uh, has some pretty, uh, Yeah, he has some pretty strong words. Surely in vain I have guarded all this that this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him and he has returned me evil for good. So it says in verse 23, Then when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from her donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed down to the ground. And then she intercedes for not just Nabal, but she intercedes for Nabal and she intercedes for everything that Nabal has. Because David is implying that he's going to come down there and capture, not just not just deal with, have a Gerd Stern talking to with Nabal, but he's going to deal with all of Nabal's estate, all of Nabal's house. So Abigail comes, intercedes for, this is verse 25, let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. What does that mean? Name means fool. So see, means what? fool is what his name means is fool. So just like a nice way, if you come across somebody and you're like, you can just say he's a Nabal. And uh, <laughs> you're, that way you're being biblical. My translation actually says Nabal, uh, for his name, let's see. Where did you say 25? Oh. Nabal is his name and stupidity is with him. Stupidity <laughs> is with him. Wow. There's a lot of Nabals running around here <laughs> in our society today. A yeah, a scoundrel. Okay. So she makes intercession for him. And then what does David do? Shows mercy. Shows mercy. He gets all Twitter-pated. <laughs> this is what you ladies do to us guys. 
get down, say a bunch of nice sweet things, and we just duh, 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 duh. we just turn we just turn Nabalish. <laughs> right? Okay? So that's that's what we do. So he, he she she gets down, she intercedes, David acquiesces, David shows mercy, and David said, All right, I will show mercy. And so um Let's see here. That's verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord and the God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working or and from working salvation with my own hands. So David said, I am grateful that you came down. I am grateful that you interceded because you saved me from being rash. You saved me from bringing guilt upon myself. You saved me from doing what I wanted to do that wasn't something that I maybe I should have been doing. So he comes down there and he praises her. So then what does, Nate, what does Abigail then do? So she intercedes for David. David shows mercy. He leaves. Then what does Abigail do? She went, what, she went, she went to the feast, verse 36, right? That's where you're at? Okay, so then, so then Abigail leaves David and she's like, all right. So she goes and finds Nabal. And behold, this is verse 36. He was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry with, within him for he was very drunk. So she sold him nothing at all until the morning light. And in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him and became as stone. Tell me what you think about that verse. Now my translation says, his heart died within him and he became as stone. So do you think that verse implies that Nabal is sitting there in his recliner and he's got, he's watching golf and she tells him, and he just pretty much turns like a stone statue. Like, have you ever seen the Chronicles of Narnia? And in the Chronicles of Narnia, the wicked witch of the... What? Which one? The wicked witch? or is it? Or, it's not the witch of the east or the west. That's, that's Wizard of Oz. The High Queen. Okay, so you have the witch. You have, you have the witch in the Chronicles of Narnia, and she's got where she had turned all those personalities into stone, and she has all these stone figures of all the people that she turned to stone there in her palace. So does, is that what you think happened? So he's, he's sitting in his recliner, and he's watching golf, and his wife tells him this, and as she's telling this, he just turns to a gargoyle? I think he got mad and his heart exploded. Think he got mad and his heart exploded? Okay. You think it's a metaphor? It's okay. A metaphor, so he had a stroke? He couldn't, he couldn't move. Yeah. Okay. So he as he heard it, a physical condition came upon him that he was rendered incapacitated. He had a heart attack. Paralyzed is what the NLT says. Paralyzed. Okay. So he had a stroke, he became paralyzed. So as she is telling him these things. He is sitting there and his condi- he has the onset of the condition. And so when she gets through telling him, there he is just stuck. Is that what you think? I don't think he was dead yet. Because the next verse said then it happened. Well, it says then 10 days later. Yeah, I think so, he had 10 days to be stuck, not being able to move, not being able to do anything but think about how foolish he had been. It's one of those things that I wish there was, I wish that there was something I could like, you know, call a friend and ask because I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, so his, so let's say he has a stroke. Let's say, uh, rendered incapacitated. So as she's talking to him, he just becomes comatose. His mind, let's say his mind is active and he can think, but he's just sitting there. It becomes as a stone, so he can't move. He has no function. He has no expression. And then 10 days later, so it's like, what happened that 10 days later he would have died from? Could that have been a stroke? Absolutely, it could have been a stroke. I mean, that those things we know medically can happen. I just, I, 
There's not an answer that we find later on in Scripture. I just find it interesting to hear what everybody else thinks or sometimes the variety of translations on how the different translations say it. Because in my translation, it just or the translation I look at, it just says he's, he became as a stone. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that he's like a sandstone, like a limestone? He just, he just stuck out there and he just turns ash gray, if you will. And he just now, he, now he's sitting in a recliner and she's coming by throwing water on him. And then I, I don't know. And I'm not trying to be... I'm not trying to be uh, blasphemous or um, flippant I just there's all kinds of wondering like what what was this and how did this work and what did this look like because that would have been a fascinating thing to see so it says that he became as a stone and about 10 days later the Lord struck Nabal and he died so that makes me wonder if it was that he died of the condition that Originally was the onset that caused him to be a stone, or it was he could have been like that in perpetuity. It was his drinking. What? I said it was his drinking. <laughs> part of it. I just wonder. Like, 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 and here's where my mind sometimes goes. You think about Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. So there's a point where Nebuchadnezzar comes out and he looks over at his his Babylonian Empire, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, I did this. This is all mine. Look what I've done. And God says, ah, well, let's have a little time to think about this. And actually makes him into a Nabal, makes him insane for a period of time. And he worms around out there in the field, in the grass, and uh, acts like an animal for a period of time. And then his reasoning returns to him. And then God restores his mind once he humbles his heart. Think about Jonah. And Jonah is deciding he's not going to do what God says, finds himself in the belly of the fish, and it wasn't immediate. Jonah doesn't say that it was the second he got in the belly, he started praying. There was a time there where he finally is like, I'm going to humble my heart, and I'm going to pray to God, and then after he prayed, boom, he gets regurgitated back up on the shoreline. So here's what my mind wonders, and this is just purely hypothetical thinking out loud. I wonder if he became as a stone and God says, are you going to repent and humble your heart? And then after about 10 days, Nabal's heart was just as hard as it was when it got started. And God says, well, time's up. I just wonder. There's no way of knowing. I, I can't prove anything. I just think, you know, sometimes I can tell you that in my personal life, there have been seasons of my life that God has given me time to repent. Um, Second Peter talks about that God is not uh, quick to act. And you know, that's where he talks about a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. So he says he is giving people time to repent and return to him. And so I just wonder if maybe right here in 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're not seeing an example where God said, all right, Nabal, you're going to be as a stone. You're going to be incapacitated. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to do whatever. You're going to have time to think about what you're doing and get your mind right. And then we'll see what happens. And then there's some people that maybe like a Nabal situation said, nope, I'm good. And God said, all right. Like Pharaoh. Like Pharaoh. Yeah. Just, just makes you wonder. Okay. So uh, Nabal dies. About 10 days later, Nabal dies. So then what happens to Abigail? She gets engaged to David. She moves. <laughs> She does not waste any time. In fact, you will see another place in the Old Testament where there was a time of mourning and there was a time of grieving when a woman would lose her husband. And in this situation, it doesn't tell us like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It doesn't give us that kind of indication. But what it does say is that verse, uh, verse 38, uh, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed is the Lord. Last part of verse 39, then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. He didn't even go and ask her himself. He sent some guys to go ask her. So I don't know what the timing was like. It may have been weeks. It may have been months. It might have even been hours. I have no idea. But somewhere, as soon as David heard that she was on the market, there he takes off. He sends for her, and what happens? It says in verse 42, And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her, and she followed the messenger David and became his wife. Well, David never wasted any time. He just took one look at Bathsheba and decided, Abigail, look what she did for us, and all of this, and oh, she's pretty good 
David was a man of quick thinking. He, 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 was a, he was a man that made his decisions. Impulsive. Yeah, impulsive. Is that right? Okay, impulsivity, whatever you want to say. So, so yeah, I mean, David, David, so I just, you know, it wasn't like David waited six months and then sent her a message. <laughs> it wasn't like David, you know, gave it a little bit of time. It was like David was phew, immediately on the scene. So she becomes the wife of David. Is that the last time we know about her? Where's the next time you think we know about her? Chapter 30? Maybe? Chapter 30, verse 5? All right, so we know that um, David, uh, he ends up going out to, he's going to go out to war with the Philistines against the nation of Israel. The Philistines won't have him. The Philistines won't take him. However, in the meantime, while he is gone, trying to go fight for the nation of Philistine, um, that why that was happening in verse... In verse 1 of chapter 30, it says, Now when David and his men um, came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made raid against the Jeb and against Ziklag, and they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, and they killed no one but carried them off and went on their way. So Ziklag was kind of home base for David during this season of life. And so David goes out to fight with the Philistines. The Philistines won't have him, so David comes back a little dejected. And when he gets back, he realizes the Amalekites have come against Ziklag, and taking everything captive, including David's two wives. Well, that doesn't set David very happy. And so it says in verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. So as the story goes on, then David musters some men and they go after the Amalekites and he takes them, takes all of his possessions back, including his two wives. And that's really the last place. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, there will be a mention of Abigail when it talks about the genealogy and the descendants of David. You will see her name mentioned, but as far as reference to her in Scripture, as far as action, um, that's really the last place that we have it. Um, so that's really why we know her is because her interaction with David in relation to Nabal and that whole um, scenario there, 1 Samuel chapter 25. So quickly, um, what lessons do we learn from Abigail? What lessons do we learn about the life of Abigail? Don't marry a stupid man. Don't marry a stupid man? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> okay. Don't marry a stupid man. All right. Well, I don't know of any woman that starts off knowing he is. <laughs> Anyways, that's a different subject. <laughs> What, what, what other lessons do we learn from Abigail? Return kindness for kindness. What, what was done for them and, and do return that. You know? Okay. Paying kindness for kindness. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing. All right. Yeah, she was really doing what he, tradition, normally he would have, he would have sent goodies out to greet him. And, My husband's a jerk. I'll do what he should do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's loaded. All right. What? what? <laughs> so one of the ones I thought about was our environment does not have to define us. So she is living, she is living with married to a very difficult person. But that didn't have to define her heart towards the things that are right, things that are true. And sometimes... Sometimes we, as people, we start to use our environment as an excuse for our behavior. And we start to use the way people treat us for the way that we treat other people. And we have no reason for that. We have no basis for that. I think I'm more guilty of it than anybody else in this room, but I, how many times do we make excuses for our wrong behavior and actions because of what people are doing around us. And I think we need to be reminded. And Abigail's a really good example that she was married to a brutish, difficult, badly behaved man. And yet, her environment did not define her actions towards other people. I think also, too, 
the lesson, one of the lessons is when you do the things that God tells you to do and you're walking in that way, the impact it has because the impact she had on David by doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. But, I mean, we, I'm, I'm the worst in the room of trying to justify, well, did you see what they did? Do you see what they're doing? Do you, uh, and we don't have an excuse. If I may, I'd, I'd like to go back a little bit. And if, I, if I can manage to put this into words, I have a hard time. The boy picking up the sticks on the Sabbath, the, he's gone. We say Moses wasn't treated fairly because he made that one mistake. But if we go back to the Garden of Eden, God said, don't, or you'll die. And, of course, Satan comes in, ah, he didn't really mean that. He, that's what he says to them. He says all the time, oh, God didn't mean that. He's not going to do that, blah, 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 blah. But the example has to be set that there is a punishment for disobedience. But he sent his son to provide a way of redemption. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And it's Numbers 15, the, the young man knew that what he was doing was wrong. And he chose to disobey. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Any other lessons? Interestingly enough, it, if you read, David said he wasn't going to leave a male alive. So there's a good chance in that culture, a lot of times you'd kill all the men and you'd take the, all the women for slaves or wives or whatever. So there's a good chance that Abigail wasn't necessarily scared for his milk, but it actually seems like she was working in her husband's best interest trying to save him. Even though she didn't like him, she didn't. Yeah, I mean, she was working on behalf of the house right. and the household. I mean, she was doing it not because she could have got up and left, saved her own skin, but she was working on behalf of the people right. in her household. Yeah. You can see that in the Middle Eastern culture today. Because like ISIS and a lot of them, a lot of times they'll kill the guys and they'll take the women to be slaves or wives or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Other thoughts? All right, one last one. Sometimes you and I start to think that we know what's going to happen next. You think about Abigail. There she is, married to this hard, difficult man one day. And the next day she's married to the king of the entire nation of Israel, living high on the hog up in Jerusalem. You should never know what is going to happen. We do not know the future. Sometimes we just start assuming, well, I already know what's going to happen. Uh, no, you don't. We, we, are, we are never guaranteed that what we think is going to happen is what is going to happen. All we can know is moment after moment, day by day, opportunity after opportunity, we show up, we be faithful, we do our part of obedience, and we let whatever happens be in the hands of God. So, Thanks for being here uh, Sunday. We'll get gathered back up. Uh, some of you might be here at the 815 Gather Gather. And some of you might wait and come to Sunday school at 945 and then come to the 11 o'clock Gather Gather. Um, but either way, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, hopefully maybe we get a couple of days to take a breath um, before the next, the next big one um, hits. So I think the next real big thing on the calendar is... A week from this Friday night will be Catalyst, the ladies' retreat, and then we'll have the men's breakfast, and then they just we got a full we got a full April we got a full April. So, anyways, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here, Ben. Will you close us in a word of prayer, and then we'll go home.